Okay, our next speaker, well, um, she doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, she's a senior policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and a former sysadmin. Uh, she's here to talk about something a lot of us have some ideas on, and that is uh, security um, frameworks. So, Hi there. Um. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I know that a lot of you would like to be, I don't know, eating dinner, um, but you've put it off for me, which I think is, uh, is very sweet. Um, I'm Eva Galper, and I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Some of you may have heard of it. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Oh, I love a world in which I don't have to explain who I work for. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is my talk. Uh, it is called The Internet Doesn't Need Another Security Guide, except the Internet Needs Another Security Guide. Um, if you have questions about my talk afterwards that don't fit into question time, or comments about how incredibly wrong I am about everything, uh, please email me at eva at eff.org. Uh, if you wish to vent your fury upon Twitter, uh, you can reach me at EvaCide, that's E-V-A-C-I-D-E, and the EFF Twitter feed is EFF, so that's not too terribly difficult. So let's get started. Why are you here instead of eating dinner? If you're in this room right now, Chances are you're some kind of security trainer or security professional. Just in case I'm really wrong, raise your hand if you are a security trainer. Oh, very few, very few. Raise your hand if you're some form of security professional. Oh, we got a lot of those. All right, I'm not surprised. Um, so if you are one of these things, you probably field a lot of questions about security and privacy, uh, sometimes from your family or your friends. Uh, or large-scale enterprises, or penniless NGOs, or freelance journalists who want to protect their uh, sources from activists in authoritarian regimes. And these people look at you as sort of a superhero. And this is good news because you get to wear a cape. And this is bad news because it actually means that they don't understand who you are or really what you do. And of course, with great power comes great responsibility. And you have two, count them, two major responsibilities as a security professional, giving privacy or security advice. And they are, number one, to get it right. I can't even believe that I have to bring this up, but uh, just as a person giving privacy and security advice, uh, you need to get it right. You need to give people advice that is not factually wrong. Uh, and the second is to communicate your advice in a way that is understood by your audience. And part of that involves understanding who your audience is, uh, coming to sort of where they are in terms of what they're capable of understanding and what they're capable of doing. Uh, and, and this part can get a little bit difficult. Uh, how many of you were at uh, Glenn Greenwald's keynote? Lots of you were there. So uh, many of you uh, may remember uh, Glenn talking about uh, his experiences sort of getting to know the, the security world uh, before you know, getting his hands on the Snowden documents. And he nearly lost out on the opportunity to do this because he found PGP just enormously difficult to use. Um, in addition to finding PGP enormously difficult to use, finally, uh, he says that uh, Snowden and uh, Laura Poitras said, all right, we have, we have a tool we're pretty sure we can teach you, and it's called TrueCrypt. So they show him how to use TrueCrypt. He installs it on his machine. He plays around with it on the weekend. He comes to Hong Kong, and he's really, really proud of himself for having mastered TrueCrypt. And he turns to, to Edward Snowden and Laura Poitras and says, look what I can do. Isn't this awesome? And he's very surprised when he doesn't see that look of you know, parental pride on the, on the face of his co-conspirators. Um, and instead, Edward Snowden tells him, TrueCrypt is kind of designed so that even your kid brother can use it. 
And this tells us two very important things, uh, which is that you do have to sort of pitch your, uh, pitch your advice at the audience that you've got. Um, but hopefully this is also a reminder to all of us to not be jerks about it. What are we going to do here? We're going to take a look at the, at the landscape of guides. Uh, we're going to zoom in on a few uh, specific projects, including uh, EFF's surveillance self-defense, uh, the security ladder, and how HTTPS and Tor work together. We're going to draw some lessons uh, from this experience. Uh, and then finally, I will issue a rousing call to arms, after which you guys will all go out and write security guides. What am I not going to do here? I'm not going to troll. I am not going to give you a long list of uh, specific instances in which I think other people's security guides suck or got it wrong, um, because I don't think that's going to help. I'm not here to embarrass anyone. I'm not here to sneer at anyone. I'm not here to look down on anyone, uh, because I don't think this actually adds anything to the conversation. So no trolling here. Um, we, I am also not going to talk specifically about what EFF thinks are privacy and security best practices. In effect, giving you our own security guide right here in 45 minutes. Um, because this is really much more of a meta talk. If you want to get into the, the weeds of, of what EFF thinks is a good idea or a bad idea in terms of advice that we might give out, uh, we can get into that in question and answer time, uh, assuming that not everybody in the audience finds that too incredibly tedious. So, you want to write a guide. Maybe you've already written a guide. Let's uh, take a quick look at the landscape. Um, the first thing that we should probably start with is Tactical Tech, because Tactical Tech is a nonprofit uh, organization that is designed mostly to write guides. And they have three things that we're going to take a look at. Uh, one of them is Security in a Box, uh, which you can get to at securityinabox.org. We also have printed copies of Security in a Box available at the uh, EFF table over in Noisy Square. Uh, there are also lots of people from Tactical Tech here who I'm fairly certain carry around copies of Security in a Box in various languages on their person at all times. Uh, the second project, also from Tactical Tech, uh, is called A Quick Guide to Alternatives, uh, which is sort of a, a best of tools, which uh, Tactical Tech recommends. And the final thing is a project called Me and My Shadow, which is available at www.myshadow.org. So here's security in a box. And this is a guide which is both printed and online, uh, written by a collaboration of Tactical Tech and Frontline Defenders. Uh, it's aimed at beginning users. It includes a how-to booklet. Um, it is translated into 13, count them, 13 languages. Uh, it includes hands-on guides and also a glossary. The various sections can be uh, remixed uh, depending on, you know, sort of uh, who, who you're talking to or who you're training. So in some ways, in addition to being aimed at beginners, this is also aimed at trainers. Uh, and one such example is Security in Context, uh, which is a selection from Security in a Box of tools and tactics for the LGBT community in the Arabic region. This is a quick guide to alternatives. Uh, it's Again, not a survey of all the tools that are out there, but sort of a best of. Here's what Tactical th Tech thinks that you should be using for a browser or search or email provider or a client. Uh, in, in the browser section, they recommend uh, Mozilla and uh, the Tor Browser Bundle. Uh, under search, they recommend DuckDuckGo. Under email, they recommend RiseUp. And uh, under a video chat, for example, they recommend Jitsi. Uh, now, uh, different people here will have different opinions about whether or not these are the right recommendations uh, that they should be making, but uh, I really want to talk about sort of the framework that they're using. And finally, uh, there's a project called Me and My Shadow, which has fantastic graphics, um, and it uses the shadow metaphor to help beginning users understand their digital shadow, or what we usually refer to as a digital footprint. 
Uh, it includes a, an interactive, interactive tool called Trace My Shadow, which lets you investigate the traces you have left through the use of your applications and devices. And it gives tips for taking control of your information and turning the tables on governments and companies. So this project is also particularly interesting to me and uh, we'll talk a little bit about sort of the, the importance of metaphors later. Um, so speaking of, uh, of the gamification approach to teaching people about privacy and surveillance, which I didn't, so, and then there's the gamification approach to uh, teaching people about privacy and surveillance. Uh, there's Data Dealer, which is an online game about collecting and selling personal data, uh, which aims to raise awareness about privacy in a new, fun way. The English version was released in May of 2013. Uh, it's also available on Facebook for maximum irony. <laughs> and if you will give me a moment here, I will play the Data Dealer video. Presumably, at the end of the game, when you become an enormous media mogul, uh, you discover that the government has been tapping all of your communications using undersea cables. So, way at the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have a couple of other items on the landscape, uh, including the Crypto Party Handbook, 
uh, which is a, a, a fairly uh, straightforward text-based guide, and also a guide uh, from the Freedom of Press Foundation called Encryption Works. And these are sort of aimed at a more middling audience. Uh, the original things that we were looking at were really aimed at beginners who are still trying to grasp the whole notion of privacy and security online. And it's very easy when you're talking to people like that to just overwhelm them with jargon and, uh, and with scary stories, uh, which can make it so that they don't really want to play at all. And they decide, well, if the government has everything all the time anyway, why should I even bother using uh, any of these tools? This is something that we refer to as security and privacy nihilism. So the Crypto Party Handbook uh, is uh, low tech. It requires a background in technology. And it's generally uh, used in tandem with crypto parties, where people show each other how to use uh, Tor, OTR, and PGP. Um, this can be useful. And I've you know, been to a number of, of crypto parties in the Bay Area. But uh, I, I found that the greatest stumbling block of crypto party has been that while it is aimed at beginners, uh, it usually lands somewhere around professionals. And so you get a group of people, all of whom already know how to use all of these tools, talking to each other about how they use all of these tools. Your mileage may vary. I'm just gonna let that one sink in. So uh, the Freedom of Press Foundation, uh, whose CTO is the wonderful Micah Lee, uh, also put out a guide, guide called Encryption Works, which is about a 30-page PDF. And uh, interestingly enough, it starts with a discussion of threat modeling. And it's very explicit about the sort of threat that it is designed to give you advice to counter. And that is how to protect your data and your communications um, against surveillance uh, by the NSA. And they do point out that by protecting your communications from the NSA, you, this, does, uh, this advice kind of uh, also applies to other governments. But primarily, they're talking about the, the NSA as their threat model. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, a lot of the assumption is that you're dealing with sort of NSA mass surveillance rather than targeted surveillance. Because as we all know, uh, preventing or you know, fighting um, sort of very targeted surveillance by the NSA or indeed any sort of government adversary is much, much harder. And finally, there are some more specialized guides. Um, what I have here is a link to the journalist security guide uh, put out by the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, the journalist security guide has uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of really inf interesting information uh, about physical security and maintaining your mental well-being in the face of really, really scary stuff. Um, but it also uh, has an entire section on internet security uh, written by Danny O'Brien, who is uh, now the international director for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, because nepotism also works. And uh, it talks about protecting your data, threat modeling. Uh, it suggests some tools. It talks about choosing passwords. And it also uh, explicitly talks about um, avoiding phishing and malware. Uh, this guide is composed largely of big blocks of text, which I assume is not really a problem because it is aimed at journalists who produce big blocks of text. And uh, finally, there is a guide called Better Crypto, which is largely aimed at uh, systems administrators. And you can get there at www.bettercrypto.org. Uh, they are actively soliciting comment right now. And the whole idea behind this guide is that they're, uh, they're providing a whole bunch of how-tos uh, about you know, sort of uh, best practices in setting up SSH or SSL or your web server or your mail server or whatever it is else it is that you need to, uh, to set up in order to protect your users. Um, what they do not provide is sort of a, a set of um, talking points for trying to justify all of this extra time and effort to your boss, who probably doesn't want to spend a whole lot of extra money. So I think there's, uh, there's some room there. Um, so let's talk a little bit 
uh, about the about the landscape and uh, what EFF thought was missing when we looked out at it. Um, probably the biggest aspect that we thought was uh, was missing. Yeah, the biggest aspect that we thought was was missing when we uh, when we looked at this stuff was a discussion of threat modeling. Uh, we found that most of these guides, when they talked about threat modeling um, at all, usually said, "This is the threat model that we are building this guide for, and we have nothing to say about other threat models because that's all very complicated." In fact, most discussions of threat modeling will begin with the words, "Well." It depends on your threat model, and it's complicated. And then usually they stop, which is kind of a problem. So we definitely wanted to talk uh, some more about threat modeling and sort of how to come up with a threat model. Because when you're dealing with a vulnerable population or a group that, that knows that they're being watched, they instinctively know threat modeling. They have a fairly good idea of what it is that they want to protect and who they want to protect it against. And what they don't have is quite enough information about what tools they should be using or what kind of practices they should be using and what their uh, adversaries' capabilities are. So we definitely wanted to talk about that. Um, we also felt that there wasn't enough uh, talk to sort of that middle ground. Uh, tactical tech builds really fantastic tools for beginners, for people to really start thinking about the issues of, uh, of privacy and security. Um, whereas guides like um, like the Crypto Party Handbook are really aimed at people who kind of understand this stuff to begin with. Uh, and the um, Encryption Works Guide is also sort of aimed at people who already have a general idea of, of how this goes. Probably the most, uh, the most common uh, criticism of the um, Encryption Works Guide that I have heard from non-technical people is that they find it scary and cypherpunkish. Uh, I think scary and cypherpunkish is a good thing, um, but you you have to go to where the people are and not where you think that they should be. And uh, finally, we we definitely felt that there were uh, not enough people who were interested in uh, creating resources to help train trainers. Um, so much of training depends on metaphors, because the map is not the territory. And uh, I think it was the statistician uh, George P.E. Box who once said that essentially all models are wrong except some models are useful. And what you want to do is you want to build useful models. So you need to make sure that you are jettisoning the stuff that's just going to confuse the people that you're talking to, but you're also keeping all of the elements that they need in order to draw useful conclusions about what they should and should not be doing. And as it turns out, that's very hard. So I am going to talk a little bit now about a, uh, a very small project that EFF did uh, called uh, How Tor and HTTPS Work Together to Protect Your Privacy and Security. And to some extent, this falls into that kind of middle ground that we were talking about. Uh, we found that a lot of people understood that Tor was a good tool and the HTTPS was a great thing that they should be using. And indeed, they suggested that people download HTTPS Everywhere, which is a browser extension that EFF uh, writes and is available for Chrome, Firefox, and now Opera. Um, so we were trying to explain to people why they needed to use these things together to protect their privacy and anonymity instead of just sort of one or the other. And we created a model. And at the beginning of the model, you can see uh, we're trying to explain what happens uh, to your data uh, where in a case in which you are using neither Tor nor HTTPS. So you can see the little, uh, the little blogger, our little user. Then you can see his Wi-Fi. You can see the hacker who's sitting on his Wi-Fi being evil, as hackers do. You can see the people at the ISP, such as a lawyer who can show up with a subpoena, or the sysadmin who can pretty much see everything, or the police who can show up with a warrant. And these are the things that they can see when you're using neither Tor nor HTTPS. Um, we, have a, uh, we have two little blue NSA guys uh, who are also trying to spy on everything. In the original version of, uh, of this 
um, project, my colleague Seth, uh, Seth Schoen really wanted to include a tiny image of NSA guys in an underwater submarine tapping cables. But uh, we decided that, eh, it's just kind of far-fetched. Who's going to believe it? And anyway, it's just going to confuse the issue. So I owe my colleagues some submarines. And then finally, you get to the, to the ISP, which runs the site you're going to, um, and a little explanation of what they can see, and the site itself, which we have called site.com. And here are the things that they can see, as well as the people who can show up and get that information, including a lawyer, a systems administrator, and a policeman. So as you can see, uh, in the version in which uh, a user is using neither Tor nor HTTPS, everybody can see everything, and that's very bad. So they can see things like your password and your content and where you're coming from and where you're going. Hmm. There we go. Here we have the version, the, a version of the same situation in which the user is using HTTPS. And when they are using HTTPS, uh, they have transport layer encryption, which means that the hacker who is sitting on the Wi-Fi using Fire Sheep can't see, what they're, uh, can't see what they're doing. But they can still see a couple of other things. Uh, the people who are at the ISP, they still see some information, but they don't actually get the content of the message. Um, even the NSA, not the content of the message, because this was before the Snowden revelations and we didn't know whether this information was going to Google or something. Uh, and uh, finally, at the site, you can see that at the site, of course, they have all the information about the content that, uh, that the user is trying to get to because that's how it works. Yes, that's my explanation. And here we, here we have our, our little explanation of what happens when the user is just using Tor. And I think that the, the most important thing to keep in mind uh, in, in our little, uh, little graph here uh, is that Tor grants you anonymity from the people at the site, maybe the people at the ISP, and maybe to a certain extent, the hacker sitting on your Wi-Fi. Um, but it does not protect the, the content of the data that you are sending out. Uh, and the reason why we thought it was especially important to make this point is because uh, in tech reporting, and indeed among most people who have you know, some technical background but not a whole lot, this is a mistake that they very frequently make. They say, but Tor is encrypted, and if Tor is encrypted, then everything must be safe, right? And that's simply not true. So finally, uh, we have our little illustration of what happens when you use both Tor and HTTPS to protect your data. And as you can see, this uh, protects a lot about your content and a lot about uh, your location from, uh, from certain types of actors, but not everything and not from everybody. Uh, we also include our two NSA guys and our, uh, our three little gray uh, Tor nodes, and we use the Tor nodes to sort of explain what you, what you can and cannot see from you know, an entrance node or a middle node or an exit node. And then we have our two NSA guys uh, who are trying to do a sort of timing attack. The next project that I'm going to talk about really quickly is uh, called the Security Ladder. Um, again, uh, my colleagues and I found that people were having great difficulty distinguishing between end-to-end -end encryption and transport layer encryption when they were trying to decide what tools they should be using in order to protect their data. Again, people just sort of shrug and they say, it's encrypted, so everything must be fine. They say it has military-grade encryption. It must be great. We should use that. So uh, my colleague uh, Seth Schoen and I once more teamed up in order to come up with an explanation for why that certainly is not the case, and also a way of sort of figuring out whether the tool that you are using is, uh, is providing you with uh, transport layer encryption or with end-to-end -end encryption and sort of what you gain in either case. Our actors here are properly internationalized. We have named them Boris and Akiko. 
And you know, here is what happens to, uh, to your message when you're not using any encryption. You know, your uh, Akiko gets the message. The message is totally readable. It is open. It goes to the ISP. It's still open and readable. It gets to the service. Open and readable. It goes to the other ISP. Still open. Still readable. It gets to Boris. Open and readable. So you know, not terribly exciting, um, but kind of scary. This is a situation in which uh, Boris and Akiko are using uh, transport layer encryption. So. Akiko has her, her message, she takes her key, she has, um, she has encrypted the message, she sends it to the ISP, the ISP cannot open the little packet, um, it gets to the service, the service has the key, you can tell the key is red, and they can open it, and therefore they can see it. It goes to another ISP before it gets to Boris, ISP can't read it, uh, it gets to Boris, Boris again has the red key, and therefore can read it. And finally, we get to end-to-end -end encryption. And you can see that Akiko is actually encrypting her message using the blue key, the, message, the key that belongs to Boris. And because the service, the red service, does not have the blue key, they cannot see it. So we feel that this uh, very succinctly uh, explains uh, why it is that you would want to use end-to-end -end encryption instead of uh, transport layer encryption or in addition to transport layer encryption. If you are concerned about the service being able to, uh, to read your messages uh, or if you're concerned about the ISP or some other you know, intervening uh, factor being able to read your message. Here are a couple of the other tools and documents uh, that EFF has been working on. Um, most recently, I went to The Hague where I had a meeting with a bunch of people who are interested in doing rapid response. So these are the people who are constantly being contacted by terrified activists and journalists saying things like, I think I've been owned, or somebody has uh, taken over my Facebook account or my Twitter account, uh, somebody has uh, installed a remote access tool on my computer and taken all my files and put them up on a website. This actually did happen to a journalist in the Ukraine. Um, so we, we thought a little bit about how to process these people and how to do triage so that the people who say reverse malware for a living aren't stuck there asking questions like, so did you plug it in? And our, uh, our answer to this problem uh, was to make a sort of questionnaire that people at the various organizations who are being contacted by terrified activists and journalists uh, can, can use to question them about the exact nature of the problem and only kick it up to, you know, sort of level, level three uh, professionals if it turns out that their skills are necessary. And it is our hope that in doing so, we can do a whole lot to prevent burnout. Uh, we also wrote a white paper a couple of years ago which uh, describes your rights at the border with your electronic devices. Um, this was a combination of uh, one, of our, one of our lawyers, uh, Marsha Hoffman, and uh, our staff technologist, uh, Seth Schoen. Uh, and this was a fantastic paper, even though it mostly gave very bad news, which is that it turns out that at the U.S. border, you don't have a whole lot in the way of rights. And so you should be especially careful when you're carrying your electronic devices. Um, we also wrote a quick guide, uh, sort of at the height of the, of the Occupy and anonymous protests, uh, to taking your device to a protest. Because it was our understanding that many people were taking their phones to protests, uh, mostly in the United States, and they were having their phones uh, confiscated and that this had the potential to um, essentially implicate everybody else that this person whose contact information this person was keeping in their phone. So we talked a little bit about, you know, take a burner phone, be very careful about the information on there, have, you know, no contact list on this phone, um, that sort of thing. Uh, we also wrote a guide called Keeping Your Site Alive, uh, which is sort of a, a guide to surviving DDoS. Uh, it has a couple of different sections, uh, including a section on choosing a good web host, on uh, doing backups, 
and on mirroring, and we talk a little bit about the different uh, about the different services that are uh, available that do DDoS mitigation. This is a really major problem in some parts of the world, including most of the post-Soviet states where uh, DDoS happens a whole lot and people are very, very concerned about it. And uh, this site has been uh, fully translated into eight different languages, count them eight, uh, and it includes a whole bunch of little instructional videos which we made in, um, in partnership with Tactical Tech. And then finally, uh, there was sort of my attempt at, uh, at gamifying uh, security issues was uh, CryptoBot, which is uh, a project that we have not yet launched. And uh, the goal of CryptoBot is to teach users how to uh, set up PGP correctly. Uh, Obviously, there are about a million different walkthroughs for how to combine, you know, Enigmail and Thunderbird or Mailvelope or whatever in order to use PGP. Um, but we wanted to make a little uh, interactive bot that would receive a PGP encrypted email from you and send one back to make absolutely sure that you can, in fact, use this thing properly. So we expect that to be launching probably sometime in January as part of a much larger project, which will include you know, sort of several such challenges for people who have never set up PGP before. And now we're going to talk about what we have learned as a result of looking at, uh, of looking at this landscape. Uh, the most important thing, I think, is uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, there are a lot of guides out there. And uh, in, in, as I said, the internet doesn't need another security guide. So if you find yourself writing exactly what somebody else has written before, rethink, uh, rethink your project. The second point is know your audience. Who's going to read your guide? How are they going to use it? How are they going to get to it? How much time do they have? All these things should really uh, inform your, your project. Uh, third. Translation is hard, but necessary if you really want to be able to reach people all over the world and not just sort of the English speaking and reading elite. Uh, you need to translate your guide. And you need to translate it into a whole bunch of languages. Uh, the major languages that EFF has, uh, has translated uh, some of its works into uh, include uh, French, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, both um, simplified and traditional. Um, also Vietnamese, uh, Burmese, which has a terrible, terrible font. Um, so there, there are a lot of people who simply will not be able to read what you have written uh, unless you bother to translate it. Uh, one of the other things that you should keep in mind if you're going to be translating uh, your, your guide into a whole bunch of different languages is uh, that keeping your information up to date is hard. The world changes, tools change, uh, walkthroughs change, the facts on the ground change, and the best advice and best practices change over time. And if you are going to be changing the advice that you give, you have to change the advice not just in the English version of your guide or the German version of your guide, but also in the Spanish, French, Vietnamese, Burmese, Russian, and that means the work of a whole lot of translators. Uh, one of the things that EFF has found really helpful in our experience has been uh, to sort of divide your guide up into tiny little bite-sized chunks, uh, which makes it a lot easier to hand over to your translator. Uh, furthermore, if you cannot keep your information up to date, I strongly recommend as a best practice to uh, put a warning up at the top of, of your advice saying, this advice was good as of this date, which is the last time that we checked. And finally, incorporate feedback. I am not that smart. I am not the smartest person I know. I'm not the smartest person in this room. If you should find yourself thinking that you are the smartest person in the room, go to another room. <laughs> you might know an awful lot about training, and you might know an awful lot about security, but chances are that there's somebody who knows more about the culture that you're trying to reach, or knows more about graphic design, or user interface, or Pedagogy. These are all things that you find incredibly useful in building a guide. Um, use their feedback because it is incredibly valuable. This is what keeps us from writing the same thing over and over and over again. 
And finally, framing matters. Metaphors matter. Being right matters. Being understood matters. You are the people out there who are giving advice. And you are our last best hope, I say, going all Leo Organa on you. In a world where surveillance is not only getting more pervasive, but people are more and more confused about what to do about it. And they rely on you to keep them from falling into security and privacy nihilism and deciding that they're simply going to do nothing. And they rely on you to choose the right tools and to choose the right practices and to think about these things in a way that you think about them every day and that might be second nature to you but is completely foreign to them. And so, what I would really like is for, for a thousand guides to bloom just as long as they're all different and they're all right and everybody understands their audience and everybody is very careful with their metaphors. I also, sorry, I also owe some thanks. Uh, the most important person that I think I, I really need to thank is uh, EFF staff technologist uh, Seth Schoen who has made a career out of very slowly and carefully explaining very difficult things to people who are not security professionals. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, second, I would like to thank Michael Lee, also a former EFF uh, technologist, now gone off to work for Freedom of Press Foundation, bigger, better, brighter things. Uh, Danny O'Brien, our international director, also the writer of the uh, CPJ guide. Uh, Hugh Dandrade, who is EFF's um, chief illustrator and artist in residence, without whom I would not have a security ladder or a Boris or a Kiko. And uh, finally, Tactical Tech, um, because I've really enjoyed collaborating with them and they do uh, such wonderful work. Uh, thank you so much. Wouldn't be able to do any of this stuff without you. Okay, we now have quite uh, a bit of time for questions. Um, if you would like to line up at the microphones, we have um, uh, scattered throughout the room. Also, we're taking questions from the internet. Please um, uh, line up at the microphones and we'll get started. Um, let's start with one from the internet. Cool. So, question? Who's playing the part of the internet? It's up here. The internet lives here. <laughs> to your right. Even if your users, uh, or even if users are brought to awareness regarding crypto, who takes care of the content providers? The EFF, Tactical Tech, who? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I had someone in my ear at the same time. Sorry. Sure. Sorry. So even if the users are brought to awareness, uh, who takes care of the content providers when it comes to securing uh, transmissions? Well, I think that the content providers actually have a, uh, have a reason to look after the security of, uh, of their users. And uh, that is that the users are now demanding it, now so more than ever. And I think that the, probably the best illustration of that is the way in which so many companies have gone over to uh, using HTTPS uh, by default on their sites uh, just over the last few years. You've seen that at Facebook and Google and Twitter, companies that uh, used to think that HTTPS was just for protecting your login information or for protecting um, your credit card uh, information, now really understand that they need to protect you, you know, all the way across the site. Um, I don't think that we've really quite made it to our you know, dream state of HTTPS everywhere. Uh, I'm looking at you, Wikimedia Foundation, but I think that uh, we've made a really good start and that it's primarily because um, users have demanded it and because uh, they've seen how easy it is to eavesdrop on uh, content that's not encrypted in the transport layer. Okay, uh, microphone number four. Hi, thanks for the talk. You mentioned the phenomenon of um, security nihilism. How do you deal with this kind of zombies? So how do you get users back into the area where they are considering using secure methods? 
Well, there are a couple of things that I do. Um, usually, if I'm talking to an audience that I see is starting to kind of glaze over and have that despairing expression, uh, I try to make them understand that, yeah, I can't get you to 100% privacy or security. And anybody who tells you that they can is lying to you. Um, but what I can do is I can make a couple of suggestions of about, you know, maybe five or six things that you should do that I will be happy to go over with you um, that will get you most of the way there. Uh, and how far you need to go really depends on your threat model. Uh, but for the most part, there are a couple of things that people can do that will vastly increase their uh, security and privacy online. And when you give them just a couple of things that they can do that will get them most of the way there, they will usually perk up and do it. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry to uh, have a uh, second question, but uh, that's not p the people I mean. I'm talking about people who really gave up, who are too lazy to occupy with some sort of security. How can you get them to at least have a minimum level of security? I think it really depends on whether it, this is coming from a place of laziness or a place of despair. Um, I'm not sure that I can do a whole lot about laziness, um, but I can do a little bit about despair. And I can do a little uh, something about bravado. I, I very commonly talk to activists and journalists who tell me things like, I am putting my life on the line every day, just walking out into the street in Damascus. Uh, I am very brave, and if the government wants me, come at me, bro. Uh, and usually what I tell them is, well, that's nice. I'm glad you're brave. Are all your contacts brave? Are all your sources brave? Is everybody that you talk to online and share information with brave? Are your parents brave? Are your children brave? Is, you know, is your family brave? Because you're essentially making this decision for them and they're not able to make an informed decision on their own when they exchange information with you when you're engaging in these kinds of practices. And as a general rule, even security and privacy nihilists care about the security and privacy of, say, their children. Okay, uh, microphone one. Hi. So, say you have some kind of expertise, um, a specific branch of crypto, a specific kind of threat model. Um, how do you identify your audience? Um, to write something sort of passionately directed at them, and how do you reach them? Well, there are a couple of different things that you can do. Uh, the, the one that I've really found to be the most useful is um, start with an audience that you want to reach, uh, not, not with your area of expertise, but with who you think could benefit from this particular expertise that you have. Uh, and, you know, work from there, work backwards. And the second is uh, to partner with people who already are engaged in this sort of outreach and training. Um, again, groups like Tactical Tech, uh, or contributing to the Crypto Party Handbook, or working with EFF. There are a lot of sort of uh, different ways in which you can go about this. I am a big fan of collaborating with, um, with non-security people. I find that the combination of a security or crypto person and a non-security, non-crypto person who knows something about, say, design or uh, designing a curriculum or, you know, uh, is able to draw uh, is a, a really strong kind of meeting of the minds and can really produce some, some fantastic results. Thank you. Okay, another question from the internet. The internet would like to know if using a phone with no contact list makes you even more suspicious than somebody who has a blank or has a contact list? I'm going to do that thing now. Well, it depends on your threat model. <laughs> and it's complicated. Uh, yeah, if you're, if you're looking, if you expect for your phone to be grabbed by somebody who is looking to go over your contact list and it is possible that they will, you know, you will be in a situation where you will be detained because you have no contact list and they find that suspicious. Um, but think about the other option. Your, your other options there are don't bring a phone, which is legit. Uh, or uh, have a fake contact list or have your real contact list and risk, you know, sort of uh, exposing all that. Uh, to an attacker. So, uh, yeah, depends on your threat model. Okay, let's take another question from Four. I would like to bring up licenses because, for example, when writing the Crypto Party Band book and also when reading the guide from Michael Lee, 
Uh, there is a really good XKCD comic on passwords, for example, but it's licensed under Creative Commons and non-commercial, and this is incompatible with like the Creative Commons share alike, which uh, we use, for example, or other people use. And I would like just to bring up the awareness, like when people write stuff, that they make it as compatible with other stuff as possible, so we don't duplicate. Like, I don't know how to install Thunderbird, for example. Yes, please. I think that this is a fine point to make. Um, now is probably a good time to tell everybody that all of the content on EFF's website is available under a Creative Commons license. Um, you can pretty much do whatever you want with it, including uh, use it for you know, financial gain, uh, and you don't even have to credit us. We are much more interested in seeing this information get out there than we are in taking credit for having written it. OK, microphone two. Uh, hi, Eva. Thanks for that. Uh, my name is Maya Ganesh. I'm uh, one of those tactical tech people, but I'm not one of those people who walks around with a copy of Sayab in their bags. I have, however, had to pay uh, excess baggage at many airports for transporting Sayab to, to workshops. So I don't work on the security or privacy program at Tactical Tech, and I don't know if that's fortunate or unfortunate considering the last um, six, seven months have been really hectic, I know, for people working in this field. Um, so uh, I don't sort of like come to this as, as an expert or even as a trainer, but as somebody who's part of this organization and part of this discussion. And um, I think it's, I mean, I really appreciate this because I know I've been seeing a lot of um, questions and debates within our organization about how best to pitch things and understand audiences and look at things like threat models. And I mean, there are enough people that you know who you, know, you, you will be talking to about this and, and are in touch with. So this is actually more a comment, and maybe there's a question at the end, but I thought that um, maybe I'd just kind of give a little bit of background to how these things are used differently, the, the resources you mentioned. So I think um, alternatives was actually something that went up in 24 hours in the wake of um, the Snowden revelations. And um, my shadow, I think, has been around for about a year and a half now. And um, it's really sort of, you know, that, that introductory um, first look at the idea of digital traces. And I think that's also kind of in transition as to where it's going. And uh, while security in a box is, is online and, you know, accessible in all of these languages, um, there is sort of like a large network of trainers and training. And, you know, it's one of those things that's also used in training. So um, there's different ways in which people can, can access um, the materials that, that we're putting out there. And, and we are kind of looking at how they fit together and who they talk to. and um, I know it's an interesting conversation. So I think, um, I mean, the, the feeling that I get um, at this point is like, wow, maybe we need to be actually um, thinking about this in terms of, um, you know, a guide to choosing the best security guide for your <laughs> needs um, and getting a little bit meta because I am actually curious about what you've learned about what different audiences are saying. So activists or journalists about how do they approach our materials because it's difficult to see from the inside out sometimes. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any um, you know, evaluations or testing or you know, what users are saying about how to negotiate this landscape. Well, uh, there are a couple of different things that I discovered as a result of doing this sort of landscape assessment. And I think probably the most important one is that um, the people at these nonprofit organizations, including my own, who write security guides and privacy guides are terrible at SEO. Because if you look up the words privacy guide or security guide on DuckDuckGo or Google or the search engine of your choice, uh, none of our stuff comes up. Uh, what comes up largely are guides, uh, quick tips uh, that have been written uh, not by security specialists but by journalists uh, and are usually aimed at maintaining a certain level of consumer privacy and never, ever uh, explicitly address their threat model in any way, much less talk about threat modeling on a, on a meta level. And I think that's extremely problematic because the sort of people who are looking for privacy and security advice that aren't necessarily part of our community are going to go to a search engine and these are the words that they're going to enter. They don't know to look for security in a box. They don't know to look for surveillance self-defense. Um, but they do know that they're looking for a guide. And if they're looking for it that way, we're not there for them. I think that's really problematic. Uh, the other thing that I think is an enormous problem is that we have not given nearly enough advice to users who are accessing the, um, 
the internet uh, using their smartphones. And this is because the smartphone is uh, both a threat and a menace uh, to your privacy and security, and so there's almost no good news. Um, but I think that simply pretending that it's not there uh, is, uh, is extremely problematic and that we really need to start looking at this from a harm reduction re approach, which is that you tell your users don't use your smartphone and what are you going to do once they use their smartphones. Uh, so I think we've, we've got a, a lot of work cut out ahead of us. And the, the very last point that I think is, is really important is uh, that we absolutely need to talk to the people in the field um, because a lot of the times our assumptions, and I'm speaking from, from my personal experience, my assumptions about what my users would be doing and what kind of technologies they rely on have um, sometimes turned out to be wrong. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking about uh, security and privacy to uh, users who are located in the Middle East, specifically in Syria, where almost everybody uses a cracked copy of Windows. And how many of you would recommend that you engage in any kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, communication that needs to be secure or private on a cracked copy of Windows? It, it might as well be, you know, written on a, you know, in the sky using some sort of plane. Uh, it's, it's not very secure. So, uh, but you've got to go with what you've got, and you need to go to where your users are. Uh, and trying to come up with uh, some sort of harm reduction approach, uh, given that very alarming limitation, is, uh, is something that we absolutely need to work with. Okay, we have another question from the internet. The internet noticed that there aren't that many women in crypto, and uh, the internet's concerned that we're missing out on at least 50% of the potential expertise. So the question is, how do we motivate more women to attend crypto parties and participate in the field? I'm not sure that the problem is a lack of motivation. <laughs> I mean, I'll start off by saying that I really enjoy CCC and that there is a larger proportion of, of women in this audience than at most security or privacy conferences that I speak at or go to. Um, I can think of a couple of, uh, of conferences, which I will not call out by name, uh, where it is really common to see no female speakers at all, uh, or very, very few female attendees. And I certainly don't appreciate showing up at these conferences and being asked where my boyfriend is. Um, but I think that if you want more women in crypto and more women in, uh, in security, the, the best thing to do is simply to make them feel welcome. Uh, to find the ones that exist and mentor them and help them because we all got started somewhere. Okay, another question from microphone four. Um, okay, I'm going to use Skype as an example, just an example, but uh, my problem is that all my friends are hopeless Windows users, gamers, such people. And even though I, you know, like we talk about this security stuff and especially after the Snowden stuff happened, it's, and I can even sometimes convince them to like come along to a protest or whatever, I, I find it impossible to change their habits, which is basically what this thing is about. And I feel I'm like I'm in a position that I have to either choose either security, where I uninstall Skype and, you know, use secure system, or my friends, do you have any kind of advice for this kind of situation? Well, I have a couple of different pieces of advice. Uh, the first is uh, this sort of um, kind of an air-gapping approach, which is that uh, if you're a gamer, you should just have a box that is specifically devoted to gaming that doesn't touch any of your other content. And this is one way to sort of... Uh, Again, the harm reduction approach, you're going to game anyway, so let's just keep it from overlapping with, you know, your personal data or the personal data of the people that you're talking to. Um, as for getting your friends to use uh, security and privacy tools or communication tools that are more secure or more private, um, usually what I do is I will walk my friends through installing them and then I will use them with them. Uh, my primary form of sort of everyday communication to touch base with my friends uh, tends to be, um, you know, uh, instant messaging using OTR. 
and if I can get somebody talking to me using instant messaging, using OTR, I can get them doing that all the time and they're in the habit of doing it and they have a method of secure communication with me and they know where to find me. Uh, so that's how I do it. Your mileage may vary. Uh, but uh, like, how do I do that since if I make them do it, I'll be their only contact on OTR or whatever? You do it with more than one friend. <laughs> <laughs> And then you have your friends talk to each other using this method. And eventually, it becomes sort of that primary form of communication. Uh, usually, the way that I start is uh, if, if, I've, if I get people who are Facebook messaging me all the time, I try to sort of you know, wean them off of it and onto OTR. Just the moment they Facebook message me, sorry, I'm not available. Can you get me on OTR? OK, microphone three. Yeah, actually, I came to this talk because from the title, I expected that the internet needs a new security guide because of what we know from Edward Snowden. And you only mentioned briefly the threat model issue. You didn't really go into it too much. So I just wonder if you have any comment on, on I mean, is there any way to really write security guides still now in the situation where we are now and what we know now? Or should uh -huh. we always... Uh, if we do a security guide, say, this only helps against a certain threat, but the NSA will still get everything. Or how do we deal with this? Well, I, I think that there are really a, a couple of questions that need to be teased apart here. Uh, the first is, I don't think that Edward Snowden changed everything. Uh, I think that we know a whole lot more about what the NSA is up to, and as a result of learning this, we have learned that the NSA doesn't know everything all the time. So in that sense, the facts on the ground are actually not that different. The main difference is that there are a lot more people who care, and there are a lot more people who are confused. And that's really where the, a sort of profusion of, uh, of internet guides uh, could really step in and help clarify these things. OK, um, I'm afraid we're out of time now. Um, uh, once again, Eva's uh, mentioned that you can contact her offline or after the program for more questions. Um, I would like to ask you to pick up your trash as you leave and make sure you leave the place nice for the next group so the angels don't have to pick up after you because we're all just like you and just kind of doing it for fun anyway. So um, keep it fun. Okay, great. Thank you.